Good afternoon again, everyone. So I'm Tiana Richards, the coordinator of Multicultural Student Affairs and the committee chair for Black History Month. And I would like to welcome you guys to our very first event of Black History Month, Dear Mama, Are You All Right? Today's event will be facilitated by our very own counselor, Ms. Shania Gray, who is a licensed clinical professional cl counselor here at the college. And first, I would like to share a little bit more information about some of our panelists this afternoon. I will begin with Dr. Janice Tuck Lively. She is an associate professor in the Department of English at Elmhurst College, where she teaches beginning and advanced fiction writing, creative nonfiction, multicultural post-colonial literature, and issues in race, class, and gender. Dr. Lively is a published writer of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Her work celebrates and examines the joys and struggles of black women lives, as has appeared in several literary journals. Lively has also been awarded residencies at Ragdale Artists, Colonial, and Kalalu Writers Workshop at Brown University. Her short story, Green Cake, has been nominated for 2018 Illinois Art Council Agency Literary Award and her sh for her short story, Dust Tracks, which was nominated in 2016 for a Pushcart Prize as she also received a Summer Literary Seminars Award in 2014 Editor's Choice Award and was a semifinalist in 2015 for the Dana Award in the novel. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Janice Tuck Lively. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Latoya Johnson Foster, who is also a licensed professional counselor in private practice and an adjunct counselor here at Moraine Valley Community College. Latoya has a bachelor's degree in psychology from so Chicago State University and a master's degree in marriage and family counseling from Governor State University. Latoya's specialty areas include working with couples, families, and African-American females with anxiety or depression. She resides in Illinois with her husband and her 11-year-old daughter, Kyla. Latoya is also the published author of I Got This, 30-Day Tips for Black Women with Anxiety or Depression. And her goal is to inspire and encourage black women to make mental, mental health a top priority in their life. Also, give Latoya a round of applause. Last but not least, we have Ms. Latoya Pryor. She is a wife and a mother of two wonderfully precious little brown children, the youngest having autism spectrum disorder. She is a licensed respiratory, respiratory therapist and healthcare professional who has been with the respiratory therapy program at Moraine Valley since 2011. Coming on as a full-time faculty and clinical coordinator in 2015, Latoya has also served 13 years in ministry in the church with her husband throughout the Chicago land and Northwest Indiana region. And she continues to preach and teach at various churches and conferences throughout Chicago land and Northwest Indiana region. She is an advocate for issues of justice, e equity, and self love. Please give me a, a round of applause for Ms. Latoya. I, at this moment, would like to turn the remaining of the presentation over to Ms. Shania Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Tiana. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, welcome to you, those who came. I know my class, you didn't have a choice, but thank you for coming <laughs> over. <laughs> um, today, we're going to spend the next hour or so having a conversation about motherhood, and especially about black mothers. You know, I invited a really wonderful panel here today. You heard a little bit about who they are just now from Tiana. You know, Janice has been like a mom to me um, since I've been here in the States, and then two of my colleagues, Latoya and Latoya, um, <laughs> are really expertise in their areas and, and have a lot to say about this conversation. So I'm gonna first start today with my panelists by saying, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, and even especially as it relates to mothering or your experience with your mother and motherhood. So would you share a little bit about yourself with, for, with us? Uh, I have, at this point in my life, I have two children. Um, I have a daughter and a son and, and two grandchildren, as a matter of fact. Uh, I was not like most of us that become mothers. I wasn't prepared for it until I became a mother. and. 
um, the mothering that I did was based on what I had seen done by the women before me, my mother and my grandmother. Um, so it's a lot like you figure it out as you go along. And um, it was planted in my mind, and we were talking about this earlier in Shania's office, that mothers, we are supposed to be these all knowing, all loving, sacrificial women. We give our everything for the love of our families. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I was getting very, very tired doing that. It was wearing that, but, but there was nothing in the world I wouldn't do for my children. And so it took me quite a number of years before I learned the balance because my whole life was making sure my children were all right. Their education, their social activities, their moral character, all of that. And I took pride in it. So there was nothing wrong with doing it, but um, I'm thankful that uh, I'm able to impart some wisdom to my daughter who does that quite well, even now with our grandchildren, that there has to be some balance in terms of herself, and I'll leave it at that. But I love mothering, and it is a, jo is, it is a job or responsibility that I help, I know it helps sh has helped shape me into who I am, but uh, yes, it can be, it can be interesting. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that, yeah. yes, yes. Latoya? So yes, I am the mother of an 11-year-old daughter, and like Miss Janice, I was not prepared to be a mom as I had just graduated high school and my plans were to go to college. So the 18-year-old me felt as though my dreams of getting a degree wouldn't be possible because of becoming a mother, but it did the opposite. It motivated me to go to school and get two degrees. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that for a large part of my daughter's life, I made sacrifices to even my physical and mental well-being because I wanted her to experience a good life. And so up until recently, I had to make the choice that not only do I need to make sure that my daughter is physically and mentally okay, I have to make sure that I am physically and mentally okay as well so that I can keep being a good mother and so that I can live a long life and see grandchildren. <laughs> and so, yeah, and my mom, she plays a part in, mm. you know, helping me raise my daughter as well. So I'm so thankful to you for that. Hi, for me, um, I'm the mother of a uh, precocious six-year-old Maylin <laughs> and um, the ever-inquisitive Dante Jr. He's four. Um, he just turned four, and he's uh, my baby that has autism. Um, and so for me, I, I didn't become a mom right away. I got um, went to graduate high school, went to college, got an associate's degree, and became a respiratory therapist, and then got married when I was about 22. My husband and I didn't actually have children until we were about six or seven years into marriage. So it wasn't, I, I don't know, I, I think it was kind of like, oh, this was supposed to come eventually. So became my mom and loved my little baby, and then my our son was like, oh, Another one came. Okay, that was that was kind of the oh here comes another one, <laughs> um, um, but um, I love being a mom. Um, I of course got a lot of my techniques and everything um, from uh, my mom and my uh, grandmother. And then as I became to evolve as a person, began to uh, discover my own way of mothering, yes. still use some of those old school methods, but with a bit, little bit of new school, as I tell my grandmother, there's more than one way to skin a cat, Grammy, you know, <laughs> so, um, so, and get the same result. And so I enjoy it, and then the, um, recent uh, developments, my son, uh, he was diagnosed last year with autism. So that has um, gave me a whole new perspective um, and has um, opened up a whole world of, I need a lot of patience um, when dealing with uh, my son, but it also um, has improved and changed the way actually that I dealt with my daughter um, when patience, you know. And so, and you need a lot of patience. I, I was like, who told me I could have two children right back to back? But um, <laughs> um, you need a lot of patience dealing with uh, them because they ask a lot of questions and want to do a lot of things. And then with my son um, having autism and having to um, 
basically kind of shift our home into a new normal because he has therapies and things. He has three different therapies that he have to uh, uh, take, and one of which is like a part-time job. Um, before he started school, he was in it like 27 hours a week. Um, so that, yeah, and I was, dear mama, had to take him. So, um, so that was kind of our new normal, but now he's down to about 15 to 18 hours. So um, I enjoy being a mom. Even with all of these uh, kind of twists and turns, I actually had to uh, stop. I was going back to school again um, for another degree and had to put that on hold so that we could get my baby together. But that's kind of the sacrifices that you make. And some people ask, they was like, well, did he want to, you know, you're going to go back and finish? I'm like, yes. But my job as a mom is to make sure that my home is in order and to make sure that my kids are in order and so I had no qualms about doing that. Thank you, ladies. So I want to start off our conversation a little bit by talking about the idea, um, specifically to black moms, the idea of the black mammy. Um, and I'll show, I have a picture of the black mammy that we're going to show you. And we're going back in history a little bit, OK? Um, a quote, which I found a quote which said, Mammy used to maintain, so the black mammy, if you don't know, you've seen the images of her, especially in older, a lot of older movies. Um, and this was the portrayal of a mother during um, slavery. And this black mammy was often the, s the, the typical, the stereotypical mom, um, black mother, who, as you know, during the times of slavery and so on, she would have cared um, for all of the children, all of the, the, the children of the master, the white children there. And so this is the picture of the black mammy that you see perpetuated throughout history. Um, one quote I found said, mammy used to maintain the patriarchal ideal of white women as passive and ladylike throughout, through this exaggerated alternative. These images show African American women as the antithesis of the American conception of beauty, femininity, and womanhood. So Mammy was always older. She was always dark-skinned. She was always overweight. Mm -hmm. She was always non-threatening, and she was always amiable. And so this was the first image, this was one of the first images you would see of what a black mother was. Now let's have a conversation about this, about black mommy and about the history of motherhood for black women. What would you ladies want to um, share about that? share about that concept and the black mammy. Dr. Lively? Um, this whole idea of the, the black mammy, it was a construct that came out of slavery and it was set up as this, you have this duality. She was set in contrast to reinforce um, white female femininity and that was it exactly. Her job there on the plantation was to care for um, the children of the master and as, um, I was sharing with Shania earlier, she was the one slave that was never in jeopardy of being sold, whereas the rest of them, they uh, that ran that risk because she was considered, quote, a part of the family. But there is this exaggerated, as you can see, femininity was not associated with her. She was desexualized. She really wasn't viewed as a, um, a sexual being uh, and non-threatening. And uh, she was very much a part of slavery, took us into Reconstruction, and um, we, were, uh, we were talking about how what we have is our big mama now. She's just a new form, if you will, of that historical figure of the mammy. She, one of the things that was, was problematic, all of her energy went towards the caring of the master's children. So it was very little left for her own children at the end of the day, and in many cases, Black mothers that had just had slave women had just had a baby. If the master's wife has had a baby as well, she was used to nurse those children. And if there was milk left over, then she was able to nurse her own children. And so I'm thinking because of that deprivation, denial of being able to be mother to her own children, this is what has created what we now have, two of this, uh, the mammy being morphed into big mama. And I know we'll, we'll talk about that later, but. She was, she was created in slavery, and she's been with us ever since in one form or another, but it was for very specific reasons as a way of viewing the African-American mother in a certain way. 
she was viewed as the mother, but she was not able to mother her own children. She was the mother of other, uh, the master's children. Yeah. Okay, Katie, do you have any thoughts about the black mammy? Um, and one of the uh, things that I'll, I like to point out about that picture, and thank you, Dr. Lively, is also um, not only was she desexualized mm -hmm. and um, she was portrayed as this unattractive, mm -hmm. unfeminine kind of uh, person, but also um, her feelings were internalized. Yes. Okay, the burdens that she bore, um, they talk about, oh, she was, part, she was part of the family, but she was not a um, willing part of the family. She was still a slave. Okay, and so that um, bore um, a lot of uh, stress on, uh, uh, on the mammy. And so all of those feelings that she had were internalized. And oftentimes, you'll often see her portrayed smiling with this big, wide, big, wide, wide, uh, kind of cartoonish like smile. But all behind that was a lot of pain. Um, and I think sometimes, um, through the evolution of the mammy, we've begun to sometimes see black moms in that, um, that you know, just keep on smiling, mm -hmm. no matter what's going on in the inside, no matter how much turmoil, no matter how much burden, keep on smiling uh, with this big cartoonish smile, but that um, leads to detriment, mm -hmm. okay, um, to not only uh, our bodies, but our families, okay? Um, she couldn't mother her own children. She couldn't be uh, the, the, the soul that her children needed. And sometimes, in, in the evolution of it in current, sometimes we bear so much as moms, black moms. We can't um, sometimes be what we need to be to our own children. And that's another burden that puts on stress and weighs on your mental health. Um, and I know we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, a little bit later, but just wanted to bring that out. Yeah, so after we see this black mammy, how has it been, and are we going to, how has it been, this, this ideal, this image, mm -hmm. this, um, this type, how has that been perpetuated today? How have we carried on um, that image in our society, in our community? even as black moms, how has that carried on to, to today? We have Big Mama. We were talking about that. There was the creation of Big Mama. I don't know how many of you have seen Soul Food. We were talking about the film Soul Food that came out a few years ago, and Sunday dinner was always at her house. Mm -hmm. She was, you could bring all your problems to Big Mama, and she was the healer of wounds, healer of emotions, and you really never saw her emotions. If she did, she cried alone. There was no one for her to really talk to. Uh, she carried the emotional burden of the family. And I think what was happened because of that mammy figure, and we get the big mama, is an idealized form of the mother. And I'm gonna stop with that because I know Latoya had probably has something to say that in Latoya, but it's this idea, we have an idea of what a mother should be that is really not based in the, I wanna say, in the, in, in the real world. Right. It's an idealized form, just like the mammy was an exaggeration. I think that's what's, uh, what's happened as well. Right, so you have this, this, this one black woman that is looked at as the big mama of the family and she was probably thrown that position from, you know, from relatives who ideally, she doesn't even want to be the backbone of this family, <laughs> but, you know, she has to take on that burden of loving for everyone, you know, not being sad, always being considerate, always sacrificing herself, not having an, ident uh, an identity. And what she even asked the question, like, what do you want to do? How are you? How can we help you? But it's always this take situation from um, Big Mama. And so, as you can see, once Big Mama passes away, the family <laughs> falls apart because there's that dependency on her to always be there to take care of everything. Meanwhile, she's battling a lot of different pains from present, and we also have you know, trauma from our ancestors that are passed down through generations. You know, although we didn't experience it firsthand, so to speak, we still can feel the pain of our ancestors passed down through our grandmothers and our mothers and even us as well. And then with um, the introduction of Soul Food, one of the things, if you guys have never seen the movie, it's a good movie, you should see it. But one of the things that we also need to, because she bore the burdens of her family, and she bore the stressors <laughs> of her family, all of that internalized itself, and she was sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She died. She was sick. <laughs> she you know, she didn't die of, oh, hey, she died because she was sick. 
she had, as they said, sugar diabetes, yeah. okay? <laughs> um, and she was sick, and she, yeah. she, had, she, she, that stress will manifest itself physically in our bodies and cause us, um, because what happens, we have um, excessive weight gain, or we put on more weight, because we're, we're caretaking everybody else. We're sweeping up after everybody else. So we don't necessarily um, put ourselves first. And so Big Mama, you know, ended up being sick, and she ended up passing away, and she ended up dying. And that does speak to, um, in present day, and in, in real form, we do have a lot of that in our communities. Um, women, mothers, you know, Big Mamas, who are bearing the burden of the families, but they're sick. They're sick, physically sick. I want to add something to that, because Latoya, you had said earlier, how when we were talking about the mammy, these women were not allowed to express any emotional ranges that I know that they, um, they probably experienced. And I think about that even with our own mothers. As children, we don't like to see weakness in our families, uh, within our mothers, because they are our emotional strength. I remember when um, I lost my husband, I was like, okay, this is a big thing in my life. And um, my children started to panic, and they actually told a friend, they said, they didn't know what to do with this. They s the thing that came out of their mouths, I've never seen my mother like this before. Well, I was grieving, mm -hmm. but I'm not allowed to do that because I'm supposed to be strong and help everyone else through their grieving and help everyone else with the weights that they're carrying. So where is the place then? Again, it becomes this thing, you have to be the mama, you have to be the one that has all this love and the big bosom for everyone and can carry everyone else within the family. Um, I think it's a role that is thrust upon us usually between your, based on your age. So if you're the oldest daughter, you may get that. But it's something we inherit and we just step into the role and we keep it going. Yeah. So and you were sharing earlier about your grandmother. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about. Uh, was I saying grandchildren? Which one was with my grandmother? What did I say? When she was scaring for the kids in Skokie. Oh, yes. Oh, this was my grandmother. Um, like so many women of her generation, she worked as a live in maid. And she worked for a very wealthy family in Skokie. They owned the uh, Stardust Hotel, as a matter of casino, in Las Vegas years ago when it was a big thing. And she lived in. So the mother, the wife of the family that she was working for, she was in her 30s, late 30s, had three young children, and she was dying of breast cancer. And on her deathbed, she had my grandmother brought in there. Now, my grandmother was a live-in maid. She would uh, come home on Friday evenings. We had her all to ourselves on Saturday. And then on Sunday afternoon, she had to go back out to Sk Skokie to care for these, th these three little uh, white children. And the mother on her deathbed, made my grandmother promise that she would not leave her children and that she would take care of her children until her husband married again. And my grandmother, would, she had been caring for this woman, caring for the house, and she couldn't wait. She said, well, after she passes, I'll be free. I'll be free in, a, in, a, in, the, in the age when she was free to go on and live my own life, find another job, doing something else. And I remember how sad she would be because she didn't want to keep doing that job. But my mother said, why don't you quit, Mom? She said, I promised her I would take care of her children because she felt safe, her children would be safe with my grandmother, which is a wonderful thing, and it's commendable, but it turned my grandmother into the same thing because these little girls had my grandmother all through the week, and I had to wait for my Saturday, my sister and I, to have her, and then on Sunday, she had to go back out there, so finally, he did, he, my grandma, every girlfriend that came through the house, like, is she the one? As soon as he married, she was out of there, but to be locked into that position, to be asked, for her to have asked, and you're gonna deny someone on their deathbed? And she was dying, and she said, promise me, Eddie, promise me you will take care of my children. And she made that promise, and she kept the promise, but at what expense to herself, I saw the sadness when she'd have to get ready every Sunday to go back to do that job, yeah. So a yeah. great sacrifice. And, you know, how many of you have seen um, Medea, Tyler Perry Medea movies? Yes, how yes, many yes, of yes, you, yes, right? Yes, and yes, so yes. you see from our, in the, in the black community, that idea of Medea, that motherly figure, the one who's always there, the one who's always um, coming to the rescue, the one who comes up and scoops up and, and helps solve the problems and gives all the wisdom. And, you know, Tyler Perry has added some humor and, and so on to, 
the Medea character, but this is almost like a, a, a stalwart, like a, a, a pedestal in our community. You know, that idea of that motherly figure who is always there, who is always sacrificing herself, who is always given, who is always surviving, who is always providing. You know, and that has continued to perpetuate, and that's not always been a good thing. And so in transitioning, um, I wanted to show this quick video and then get your thoughts on it. Describe my early years of being a labor and delivery nurse as soul crushing. <laughs> There's no, no reason that African-American women should have four times the highest death rate. For white women, about 12 women die per 100,000 live births, but 43 black women die, 12 versus 43. It's not genetic, it's not socioeconomic, it stems from systemic racism embedded in the healthcare system that overlooks and undercares for these women. Often I hear from African American women that they aren't heard in the healthcare setting, that their complaints are taken seriously, that they have to be really repetitive and really aggressive in stating those complaints. And on the other hand, there's hyper vigilance or hyper surveillance. So black and brown families tend to have much greater scrutiny, their motives are often questioned, black women are twice as likely to be drug tested. So where a Caucasian family might say, wait a minute, we don't want to do the things that way, we want to know more about our alternatives, when black families do that same type of thing, uh, uh, they're often questioned and held suspect. The ongoing stress that African American women may be subject to in the healthcare system, it often serves as a disincentive for women to even enter the system. Uh, so they may enter prenatal care late, which again, if there are problems, they may go longer without being detected. It won't be done overnight. Uh, but what is really needed to fix this is culture change. The work has to begin with administrators who have the power to transform policy uh, that folks have to conform to that force them to examine their biases when they're in the midst of it interactions. <laughs> Sorry. So we see even from this video here that even before a woman becomes a mother, right, she's already starting to face challenges. Um, a black woman um, based on her race, right? We, we recently heard about Serena Williams' story. Serena Williams had a child, and we know who Serena Williams is, a famous tennis player, and she, she, she recalls she had to advocate strongly because she knew um, she had a condition that she would clot, her blood would clot. She knew what she needed. She knew her health issues, and still as a millionaire, as a famous woman, Serena Williams had to advocate and advocate for herself to get the medical treatment she needed in order for her to not to die in childbirth and thereafter, right? So what would you say, um, given this, what are some of the other issues and what do you think about this and some of the other issues that black mothers struggle with um, in our society today? Well, one of the things that the video brought out, um, I, I work in healthcare. I'm a respiratory therapist. Um, so I help, I tell people simply, I help people work for every breath every day. That's what I do. Okay, and so from the beginning of life to the end of life, that is, that's, I'm there um, as a respiratory therapist. And so, um, so we go to those high risk deliveries, those high risk births. I'm the one there resuscitating the baby um, and trying to pick up that baby so that baby can cry, so the mama can release her breath and stop holding her breath. Um, and I'm the one that's withdrawing life support from your loved one when you've decided that it's time for them to die, you know, that they, they suffered enough and they need to transition on. So with that being said, um, she made a very important point. Um, a lot of times um, what we have stemming through um, the healthcare system pervasively is um, um, remnants of systemic racism and um, 
those notions, those old school notions, those racist notions um, that um, actually st come back and stem from slavery, from 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 slavery and mammy, you know, that black women uh, don't feel okay, um, that we can tolerate high levels of pain and, um, and that we're not listened to and valued. Those infect and permeate um, every aspect of our lives. And so, um, yes, black women do die at a rate about four times that of their white counterparts um, because they simply aren't listened to. And what we found is, is they did a Harvard study and they did a CDC study. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic background, doesn't matter your college education, does not matter even to access to healthcare, the rates stay the same. The rates stay the same. Um, and we found that with Serena Williams, we found that with uh, Judge Hatchett, with her uh, daughter-in-law, um, was at uh, Cedar sinai and her daughter-in-law uh, and her son, um, she had just had a baby and she was healthy and um, runner and everything. And the, the husband, he said he asked for hours on top of hours. And what they found out is that she was actually internally bleeding and he kept asking and advocating they they and what was found is that they had written for a stat ct but they kept pushing it back and pushing it back and nobody um heeded his urgency uh, regarding uh his wife and he they're well to do well to do folks um and my own personal my own personal story when i had to advocate for myself when i was a, a patient in the hospital having my children and i had to be very verbose about my needs i and i had two cesarean sections and i had to look the nurse in the eye i said i just got cut open like a whale yes i'm in pain and yes you're going to give me pain medication i told her my pain was a 10 she asked me was my pain really a 10 what do you mean you i'm in my body i know what the pain is i know what i'm feeling you know, I know I just got sliced and diced. Yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting here. And so, um, and just, um, just the, you have to advocate um, harder on your behalf. It's um, shown even in our healthcare system um, when uh, minorities, African Americans and other minorities go to the emergency room, that they're li less likely to be treated for pain Let's like treated for pain um, and believe that they have pain um, and more um, and be referred to as more having drug seeking behavior. So um, those things kind of permeate um, our, our psyche. OK, people, you know, you can be the nicest person in the world, but we have certain uh, unconscious biases. OK, that we deal with. And so those things do permeate our society. And so for a black woman who who historically has been kind of um, debased okay and have kind of been put off to the back burner and put off to the wayside and not being um, um, uh, really counted I guess you could say is really counted sometimes what we're saying and what we're feeling does go um, un unheeded and unfortunately it has resulted in the loss of lives and a, a lot of preventable preventable deaths and I've been at a couple of them a lot of preventable deaths mm -hmm. yeah I remember um, seeing a clip recently Within the last couple of months, basically a doctor admitting that they don't believe that black woman is in pain, and he didn't even have a reason why. So to know that there was them and it was passed down, but even to bring it more personal, I remember having a lump in my breast, and I have breast cancer that runs on both sides of my family. And I remember going to my doctor and I had to beg and cry for him to do a breast exam mm -hmm. to see if it was really a lump or what wasn't. And his, and his response was, you are in your early 20s. Breast cancer typically affects women age 40 and higher, I believe. But you see time and time again that women younger than 40 are yes. dying for breast cancer. Yes. So if I'm coming to you with a concern that I have, see about me why do i have to cry beg and plead for you to hear me and it's like black women we are constantly fighting to be heard in different settings not even just in healthcare. we are crying to be heard in even the workforce even for a position that we know we are qualified for why do we have to convince you of our greatness you know why do we have to convince you that we are in pain like why is our pain questioned in the first place, so that's my thought. I think one of the things too that, um, and I applaud the generation of women that have come after me, you're, that they're learning 
to advocate for themselves because primarily um, with my peers and myself, I always knew how to advocate for my children as a mother. I will take a bullet any day for my child. I will go up against I don't care who for the rights of my children, for their health care, for their education, to make sure they get the things that they want and, and need, that I deem that they need for them to be the um, human beings that they have a right to become. And I don't, we're just now starting to do that for ourselves. Um, we've not always done that. I, I remember my grandmother um, who, um, she died with ovarian cancer and she had been complaining to us for a while about certain symptoms she was having. I said, have you talked to your doctor, Nana? And she said, oh, you know, I've mentioned it, but since he didn't, you know, he really didn't make a big deal out of it, she just kept going along with it and kept going along with it. And I think that gets into the whole, goes back to this whole syndrome that we're talking about, these powerful black women, we don't feel pain the world doesn't believe we feel pain, and we've convinced ourselves, or they're trying to convince us that we don't feel pain, but we're starting to say, yes, we do. Um, but yet, I'm quite sure, uh, Latoya, you could tell us the statistics in terms of the number of black females that suffer from strokes and diabetes and heart attacks and high blood pressure, and all of these things because of the stressors we're carrying in our bodies, because we're carrying the weight of everyone else, but not caring for ourselves. It's, it's a problem with women in general across the board, and even more so with women of color. Um, that, and we convince ourselves we, we can live with pain. I, I have one friend, her mother, she ended up having a tumor, and when she finally did go to the doctor, it was the size of a basketball. How can you walk around with something like that inside of your body? You keep pushing. Because it's like in slavery, what were we taught? Keep it moving, keep it moving. And when we think about it's a choice between the kids, needing something, the husband, kids, myself, their needs first, keep it moving. And there has to be a recalibration in terms of our thinking, and I think Latoya's addressing it with her book and things, where we began to, I love being a mother. My husband, when we decided to have children, like, it's been one of the greatest joys of my life, but I've had to learn to be a healthy mother, uh, to be healthy myself mentally and emotionally, physically, and we, d we, den we deny our own physical things. I will, I'll go take my child to the doctor in a minute, take my grandchildren, but I'll wait for me. It's like, oh, I'm okay, keep pushing, keep pushing. And I think we have to be, we have to consciously, intentionally, as you're saying, take care of ourselves. So is this like part of the, what you hear all the time, the strong black woman syndrome? I, I don't wanna be that no more. <laughs> what is this and where is it coming from? Okay, because you hear this all the time and it's perpetuated in media, in movies, in TV, and so on. And so is where is this coming from, and, and is it helping, is it hurting us? Let's talk a little bit about that, that strong black woman syndrome. I think it's hurting us. I feel like that came from watching our mothers and our grandmothers be strong, and so we kind of take that on, like we have to take on everything and be strong for everybody. Meanwhile, we are dying inside, we are crying, we are about to, you know, just have a mental breakdown. You know, like we say, our nerves are bad, but it's not our nerves, we have anxiety. You know, we're sad, that's depression. We have to start putting the term to these symptoms that we are feeling. And so as, as I was looking more into the strong uh, black woman syndrome, it's more of the ability to manage different roles that you play in the lives of others. So that is being a mother, that is being a homemaker, how you are in your romantic relationships, how you are functioning in your friendships. And sometimes you just have to take a step back and say, I can't be all things to all people. I can continue to put everyone else ahead of me and not take care of myself. It's also uh, strong black woman syndrome is not being able to feel vulnerable because you don't wanna be looked at as weak. But it's okay to be vulnerable because your body can't be in fight mode all the time. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to release and relax and just pass off roles to other people and let them know, like, I can't do this anymore. So I'm like, I'm like Miss Janice over here. I don't make me the strong black woman. I was quick to tell my husband, I am not superwoman. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it all by myself. I need your help. <laughs> yeah. 
I want to add one thing to what Latoya said, Shania, that the whole idea of the strong black woman, if we think about it historically, it was all we had. We were denied everything else. If you take it back from slavery with the whole thing with the mammy, the only thing that we did have that was celebrated and that we could take pride in was our strength. Mm -hmm. And so we, we took that thing and we ran with it. Yeah. If I'm not allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to be this or that, this is the one thing I've been given and I do it well and we keep doing it and we doing it. And so it became the sim that was what we prided ourselves on, be a good mama. What does that look like? Well, this is the way my mother did it, this is the way my grandmother did it, and her grandmother, did it. and we continue it on, but now we do have some choices and some other things that we're allowed to do and to learn to do that balance. Because when I went to grad school to get my doctor, my husband had to learn how to cook. I'm like, I can't keep doing it. Right. And my son would come in, mom, what's for dinner? I'm like, ask your daddy. <laughs> and I love cooking. I love cooking for my family, but at some point, I was trying to do all of it, and if I'm gonna be successful doing this, I need some help for you to, he was a little resistant at first, but he learned to cook, and he at one point thought he was a better cook than myself, but it wasn't true. <laughs> um, but it was that, but at some point, that was all we had to showcase or to celebrate was our strength. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I just want to say that. And I think, thank you, Dr. Lavi. I was gonna touch on that point too, and I think that once we come back, uh, to it, um, w we hold on to this strength and everything, and we hold on to this strength, um, and our backs are breaking. Mm. Okay, we hold on to this strength, and 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 we're, we're strength in spirit, but in essence, our backs are breaking. And then what happens is, is that then we fall apart. Okay, but one of the issues that I think that has been created is then when we fall apart, there is no network or no support around to catch us. Okay, um, and to catch our families. You know when when they fall up when when they inevitably fall apart and then there's um, and then so you in your mind think of the uh, repercussions of you being vulnerable and you falling apart and so you don't you suck it up and you and you keep going and I think uh, one of the uh, things that we need to improve upon is creating spaces where folks can be vulnerable. And you know and I I think about this because we we've been taught from young like you have to fight to survive, right? And it's a matter of life and death. It's not a matter of, okay, well, I can just put it aside and everybody will be fine, right? We see every day our kids are dying on the street, black and brown kids, right? Then we have the conversation about, well, there's a lot of single moms in the black community. And then we know one of the major reasons for this is when we look at our system of incarceration, right? If anybody hasn't seen the documentary 13th, they gotta see that, where it shows that from the 80s and 90s, all of the black men in the community who were family men, um, most of them were incarcerated for smoking some weed, which is legal now, and which people are making billions of dollars off of. So that destroyed the family, and the woman had to continuously step up. And she knew, I need to take care of my babies. Whether I work 60 hours a week, come home, I need to make sure my babies are taken care of. It's that instinct that kicks in. But then we get into that when we're constantly, you know if you see a car coming at you and you move out the road, you're gonna, your body's gonna react. You're automatically gonna try to move out the road, right? So it's that kind of that, that your sympathetic nervous system is kicking in, the adrenaline is kicking in, cortisol is being released in your body, that fight or flight syndrome, mm -hmm. right? But if you're in that constant mode, and, and Janice and I were talking about this a little bit um, Sunday at church, you know, she goes to the church that my husband pastors, and we're talking about this, like you're constantly, and that's why a lot of times what happens with anxiety is that you're constantly in that mode, and your body is constantly releasing that cortisol and so for a lot of women of color, for a lot of moms of color, it's not necessarily, they're not gonna say you, they're depressed or anxious, but then it manifests in those chronic illnesses, mm -hmm. the high blood pressure, the obesity. It manifests in the diabetes. It manifests in the heart conditions, right? And it's because of all of these underlying issues, all of these underlying concerns, all of these underlying pieces, right? We don't have wealthy parents to fall back on. Right, we don't have wealthy family members to fall back on. You know it's sink or swim, you know? So you get into that mode, like, 
there is that level of resilience which we admire, but which also hurts us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. And so it's always hard to manage that and to address that. And internally, we're struggling because we're told we need to be strong. Mm -hmm. We're told we need to fight. We're told we need to persist. What kind of mother am I if I'm not strong? Mm -hmm. What kind of mother f am I if I'm crying in front of my children? Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of mother am I? What kind of woman am I if I'm not the best at work and I'm not the best at home? Because I know at work, as a woman of color, I have to prove myself 10 times harder to succeed at my job and to be promoted. So it's not that I'm just working the level, I have to work harder because nobody, you know, my husband and I, um, he teaches for Bible College and we, we went to Israel two years ago. And so we were shepherding a bus where he was teaching. Um, and just for him, he's a, you know, an African American male. And I said to him, honey, listen, this is where you're starting from. People aren't gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. People aren't gonna believe your authority immediately. You're gonna have to prove yourself to them. His white counterparts, they believe their authority, they're Bible teachers, they know the Bible and so on, they know that I said. But when after you teach, after they realize you know, you know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. they're gonna appreciate you. And so said, so done. At the end of the trip, this lady came up to him and said, you know, I didn't know what to think of you at first. <laughs> you know, I was skeptical about you. But after I heard your teaching and after I realized, you know, I appreciated you and I really loved you. And this is kind of an example of what we face on a regular. So from work, from society and so on, we have all of these issues that we continue to struggle with, that we're dealing with, that we're balancing, right? It's kind of juggling, like a magician juggling. And we can't let any of the balls drop, because God forbid any of those balls drop. We're gonna fall apart, our family's gonna fall apart, our community's mm -hmm. gonna fall apart, what are we gonna do? I had uh, my son, um, I, r I remember he's, he works as a, a financial officer for a corporation, and I remember, it was a few years ago when he first had graduated and was starting his career, and he said something, I said, oh, well, you're gonna need me. He had said something, I said, well, you're gonna need me to help you do this, this, or that. It was something financial. And he said, no, I'm not, Mom. He said, you've raised me where I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna need you to do that. I hopefully, I'm gonna help you do that. And I had to learn that with my daughter, too. It's like, it's been ingrained in me. I'm supposed to come to the rescue. And I'm having to retrain myself. They're like, no, you don't, Mom. We've got this, and they want me to, you just relax and be you. And they have to keep reminding me that it's taken a few years now, but I'm like, let them worry about this stuff. If they need me, they'll come to me. But I think that's been a part of that image that we've had, that, we've, that we're supposed to always be in the ready. And I think Latoya was talking about that earlier, what you were talking about, always on guard. Mm -hmm. And I was looking through her book, and if you should, it was just some of the things that we can do daily to help reprogram ourselves to say it's okay K not to balance, have to balance, keep all the balls in the air. Because heaven forbid, if I drop one of those balls, what will people think of me? Because my value is based on how many I can keep in the air simultaneously at one time. Yeah. So, and Latoya, I came across a statistic that said 50%, um, really and truly that African-American women um, are 50% more likely to suffer with depression mm -hmm. than Caucasian women. Can you speak to that? Um, and even tell us a little bit, because I know this is your heart and your mm -hmm. passion. Um, and if you haven't seen, Latoya wrote this wonderful book, which is at the back for purchase. It's called, I Got This, um, 30 Day Tips for Black Women with Anxiety and Depression. And it's a wonderful book um, that you can purchase and you can give to somebody or you can use for yourself to help you cope with this. But speak to that. Mm -hmm. Why that's then, that's you know, this anxiety and depression that's 50% more likely because in a black woman? Right, as we discussed earlier, we are unheard. And sometimes because even in my own family, we didn't talk about mental illnesses. Like I had no idea of what anxiety and depression was until I was almost out of high school. 
And once I got through grad school and started doing more research about it and information about it, I said, oh my God, I was depressed as a teen and I didn't even know why I was sad most of the time <laughs> because I didn't talk about it, we had our pain. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I hid my pain really well. Even recently dealing with depression um, two years ago, no one even knew what I was going through. And my mom said to me last week, she said, I didn't know that you were going through depression because I still went out with friends. I still went to work. I still showed up as the role of a wife, a mom, a friend in all of these different settings, yet I was still sad at the end of the day. And so one, we don't talk about it because we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be seen as weak. And two, if the doctors don't believe us, who else is going to believe us if we're saying we're sad? You know, most therapists are white men and white women. And so black people specifically don't feel comfortable going to a therapist if they are not the same color as them because they feel as though my therapist is not going to understand my pain, what I'm going through, my symptoms. And so what I've seen working in private practice is that I will get calls specifically because I'm a black woman, one, and two, my specialty area. So I see more African-American women and men in therapy than I do any other race. And I'm fine with that because for me, it's showing me that, you know, our people are, are becoming more comfortable with saying, I'm not okay, I need some help. So do you also think we've internalized, so there's this concept I've come across and I've been thinking a lot about it recently. Um, when you think about images of beauty and so on, right? Uh, when you, 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 you don't, if you Google beautiful woman, you won't see a black female show up. You have to Google beautiful black woman, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you think we've internalized certain things, negative, aspects about ourselves that's also contributed mm -hmm. to how we feel and our struggle that we're not even even aware of like internalize certain aspects of oppression or how we should be yeah absolutely I mean look at the pictures in the media it's always a lighter skinned woman with either straight hair or a super fine curly hair but it's never dark skinned women like myself with this curly natural hair, you know, portrayed as beautiful. And so, yeah, you do internalize that because, you know, think about the messages you even get from childhood. You know, I used to hear, you're beautiful for a dark skinned girl. Why can't I just be beautiful because I'm beautiful? Why does me being dark skinned has anything to do with it? So what I internalize is that if I was lighter skinned, I would just get the message, wow, you're beautiful. I don't want to hear because I'm dark skinned that I'm beautiful, you know. And so, yeah, it's, you know, messages that comes consciously and consciously from your community, from the media. You know, you look at these magazines, it's not, it's, it's, it's lighter women, it's white women because Europeans look at beauty as being a white female. Or if you're not white, then you are about your color. Yeah, so. But, yeah. but that also is not only from the outside. It yeah. exists within our own community, mm -hmm. which is where even greater stressors come from. Um, I, can, I can remember as um, um, growing up as a, a young girl and as a, as a teenager, never feeling that I was beautiful, never made, because my lips are full had a wider nose. Now it's fashionable. People getting, you know, collagen pumped in their lips to have lips like mine. It wasn't fashionable when I was, was coming up. And never being thought I was attractive. So for me, almost like the mammy, I didn't focus on beauty. I'm not beautiful. I never will be beautiful. So I focused on being smart because I knew I could do that. Again, we grasp hold to that one thing that we can. But it's an unconscious. It's, it's like what you were saying, Latoya, you're carrying the thing around with you. That stress is there and you've internalized it and you keep moving, but you, you're always wanting to either live up to that standard or knowing that, or the weight of you knowing that you can't live up to that standard, but it, it steals another internal rate, a weight that you're carrying around with you. 
And I think sometimes, and then also in our in ourselves in our community, because we've seen these images, mm-hmm. and because we've uh, you know we've bought into what other people uh, people's standard of beauty was, we didn't embrace our own. Okay, we didn't embrace you know these under this wrap. It's very beautiful, full thick curly hair okay under this um wonderful wrap and but we didn't embrace you know our full lips we didn't embrace you know our our wide eyes and you know our wider hips we didn't embrace those things and so um it kind of um set up another dynamic of kind of self-hatred um um, in our own selves and in our community. And then we, what we did is we kind of passed that standard off, you know, to our, our young brown babies, you know. And so, um, and, 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 and that became a problem. And so now we've began to embrace, you know, um, our curves and we've began to embrace our, our, our lovely curls and we've began to embrace, you know, all of those things that make us who we are. And not that we're just, you know, outside and superficial, but it's important to look in the mirror and love what you see. It's important to look in the mirror and love, you know, um, that person. And she got beautiful for a brown skinned girl. I just got, I was beautiful for a big girl, you know. I was thick, I've been thicker than a snicker all my life, okay. So, uh, so you know, and so I got that. And so, and, and but it was okay. And I, and I played sports and I always played sports. And I didn't like being it because all my friends were thinner, you know, and but my family was big boned, you know, <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, they were big boned, and so it's like, oh, you know, and, you know, but I've learned to embrace it, and and I'm now I'm currently learning to embrace my healthier side of being thicker than a snicker. So y'all pray for me on that journey, um, but just learning to embrace ourselves and break the the basically the bonds and the chains that have held us so long, um, because that stress and that weight that you know that other people portrayed on us and then what we began to accept about ourselves it did nothing but make made us sick it made us sick and so you know i'm very glad that we've began to you know embrace everything about us the Mm -hmm. tides are turning and so to wrap up what is one piece of advice what would you give to a black mom out there who is dealing with all of these things and moving forward in their life and being the best they can be. What is one piece of advice you would give to that mom who's out there, who's listening? And I recognize that other moms of different races and ethnicities struggle with a lot of these issues as well. So what's one piece of advice you would give to them? I would say just take care of yourself. Put yourself first sometimes and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Accept the fact that you cannot do everything. You cannot be everything to all people. And so, yeah, just making yourself a top priority. I would say, uh, number one, get Latoya's book, because I put on it, because there's something for you to do every day. But even more so than that, uh, it would be wonderful that every day to ask yourself, what do I want? Because s- we're so out of touch with ourselves. Sometimes we want so every day, what do I want today? And sometimes God and I have that conversation. What do I want to do today, God? Or what do I want? And you may not know, but it sets you on that course uh, because we're always thinking about what will our families need for that day or our students or what they'll want on the job. What do I want today? So to take the time to pause once a day to think about yourself. Yeah. I think my advice that I'm learning to take is that it's okay not to be okay. Mm-hmm. It is okay not to be okay. It's okay to stop. Um, as the, the, the little, I, I got small kids, to stop and listen to play safe. It's okay to stop <laughs> and listen to yourself to make sure that you're safe, to make sure that you're safe in mind, that you're safe in body, that you're safe in spirit. It's okay. I'm learning, I'm, I, the advice that I minister to you, I give to myself. It is okay to just stop and listen to yourself. It's okay to stop and say, you know what, I am not okay. And it's it's okay to stop and ball your eyes out some days. Um, you know, the, the showers become a haven, you know. It's okay to do that. And, and when you realize that you're not okay, it's okay to find somebody to talk to to help make you okay. Amen, yes, yes, yes. 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 And to add to that, I would say you're good enough. You're a good enough parent. You're a good enough woman. I remember learning that concept in grad school, and I hung on to it, you know, because in our society, we're seeing social media, seeing all these images, and and women doing this, and mothers doing this all the time, and they posting perf- um, images of what we see in like perfection, and we're always striving, you know. No, it's good enough, mm-hmm. you know. I don't have to be the perfect parent. 
I don't always have to be out with my kids. And okay, it's okay if my son sits in front of the TV for a little <laughs> bit while I take a nap. I don't have to be playing with him, you know. So just for us to really sit and reflect and think about that. Now I want to thank you, ladies. Um, we're going to open up for questions. And as well, I want the audience to participate. We have, if you're a mom, we have a treat for you. But if you're not a mom, we want you to take this and give this to your mom. And as well, we have some cards for you. Um, and I want you to take a moment to write something to your mom, a nice note, something you're thankful for, um, something you love about her. And so just take a few minutes and write that and give that to her, you know, because this is ultimately a tribute to mothers, okay? So we want to open up for any questions. If anybody has any questions, Troy, could you walk around with the mic or somebody else? Shania, can I say one thing that came to my mind as you were, um, you were finishing up? I think all of us sitting here up on this panel would like to say we are grateful for and we appreciate those big mamas that went before us. Uh, if they had not been there holding down things, we probably wouldn't be here today. But I do think we owe an obligation to them to be our best, healthiest selves so that what they did does not go in vain. That we're not going, so that they can take a breath and they don't have to still be that. Um, because uh, I don't want anyone to think that we thought those women, oh, they were soft. They did what they needed to do at that time, but they provided us with a better opportunity, and we need to take advantage of it. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions or thoughts they want to share? Hi, I don't have a question, I just have a thought. I just wanna say thank you so much for having this. Um, this is a great opportunity. Me, myself, being a mother and, and hearing you and understanding this now, it really gives me um, the strength to actually do that. I need to go to the doctor, <laughs> you know, stop putting everybody else first and put myself first and go to the doctor. So I wanna thank you all for that, okay? This is a comment, not a question. Oh my God, this was amazing. Like, like every minute was just like packed with so many powerful ideas, useful ideas that a lot of us can take so much from. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, uh, your hearts, your souls. This was just amazing. And you know, I changed my mind. I do have a question. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, do you see anybody from uh, in African-American literature or African-American pop culture, a woman, beautiful in her own rights, and who doesn't feel like she has to prove herself and prove to be strong. Do you feel like there's anybody out there right now paving the way, you know, comfortable in her own skin and not, not needing to, to like put herself through so much unnecessary suffering? Is there that role model out there? Does she exist right now? Uh, I'll ask her, defer to our professor of English first. <laughs> <laughs> As you were talking, um, I thought about one of my favorite characters, and um, she might not be viewed that way, but for me, Sula Peace. Sula is a beast, and I love her because she did put herself first in some way. So there was some selfishness in her, right. but she prided herself on, in terms of I am who I am, and people need to accept that. When I think about in um, um, popular culture that's out there now, this she's a woman that has passed, but I always admired her sense of, her sense of self, and from that, for me, that was the poet Maya Angelou. Whenever I saw her in a room, and, and even her poem, yes. Phenomenal Woman, yes. these are the hips I've been given. <laughs> this is the hair I've been given. This is the skin color. This is who I am. And wanting to celebrate that, but also um, understanding the nurturing and the care that's needed. So for me, those are two that I look for. And of course, I look back on my mother now, and I didn't appreciate it 
when I was younger, um, my mother never got the degrees that I have and all of that, but I realized my mother was one of the, s the most beautiful, wisest, most wonderful women that ever walked the planet, and I hope I helped her to feel that before she left here because she was one of those that had so little, was underappreciated, carried some weights that she should not have carried, but um, in the end, my sister and I came along beside her and said, give it to us and we'll help you carry it. And I think that's, that's one of the things in um, Edwidge Danicott, and I'll be quiet, her book, um, um, it's not Crick Crack, I forget the novel, but there's one of the things that the women in the field and, hey, she, and Haiti would say, call out to one another, sister, uh, it was m almost like the sister, are you okay? Sister, how's your load? Mm -hmm. You know, because they would be willing to share each other's load, and I think that's one of the things that for me is so important, the community of women. We need each other to be able to cry to, to be able to reach out to and come alongside one another and say, I'm here for you. Um, and to be able to say, we do need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's for me, Sula Peace and Maya Angelou. Sula Peace, Sula. She wrote, she's an author? No, Sula is the character in uh, the novel Sula. And uh, she's just fierce. Uh, it's one thing that these young men were going to attack her and her friend Nell, they were gonna, uh, you know, I guess tried to rape them or something. And Sula had a little pocket knife. She was a young girl in her pocket. She pulled out the pocket knife. She stood there staring at the boys and she took the pocket knife. She cut off the tip of her own finger. And she said, if I'll do this to me, what do you think I'll do to you? And they scattered. So I, I just like, it's like Sula, she's, okay. uh, she was just, everybody in the community didn't appreciate her, but she appreciated herself. And that's the thing why she's a hero. Yeah. And for me, Maya Angelou, yes. I actually had the opportunity to meet her, and I, as a memory, I will cherish yeah. all of my days. Um, and then also, um, Sister Angela Davis, love Angela Davis, and also uh, Sister Viola Davis, um, who, um, in a world, in, in an industry where beauty is almost everything, um, and a certain type of beauty, she has really just um, bared herself to say, I am who I am, this is who I am, you know, inside and out. And she has a wonderful soul. Um, if you've ever just sat and listened to s uh, her interviews and some of her uh, just talking, she has a wonderful soul and a wonderful spirit that is just really um, kind of paving the way for those behind her, not just in the industry, but uh, women of color just coming behind her that, you know, it's okay to be who you are. You can demand your worth. Um, and I, that's what she's really big on is demanding her worth, um, and because she, she's wonderful. So for me, those those are Thank few. You. Yeah. And um, I really like um, Alicia Keys did something a, a while back where she stopped wearing makeup, yeah. and I really liked that. Like she wanted to just show her natural beauty, yeah. and when I think of pop culture, because even Latoya and I were having this conversation: who are the moms? Who are the black moms that? TV and movies portray, and they're often not good images. They're not often you're just regular moms who are just you know going about their day to day. There's always something eccentric, or they they portray them in a really negative light. And so you know, Hollywood needs to do better. But I think about Alicia Keys, and I really like she didn't wear makeup, and she was beautiful as she was, and that was huge. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, if you so guys are interested, I am doing a book signing in the back if you want to purchase a copy for $15. So at this time, we will conclude our event, but first I would like to give all the moms um, a round of applause that are here. And another more formal round of applause for our lovely panelists and our facilitator. We do have a small token of appreciation for you guys. And if you do have time, as LaToya mentioned, please stay, have an opportunity to meet her, learn a little bit more about her book. And I hope um, this event led to you guys having an eye-open experience, being more appreciative and um, thoughtful to all moms, regardless of anything, okay? Last, last thing, one second, we gotta plug Black History Month. <laughs> So as I said, that this was our first event, and it went very well, so thank you ladies again. Next, tomorrow we have, it begins our You Matter series. Sorry, I'm trying to, this poster's a little large. 
and it, it is led by our Black Student Association. It's called Barbershop Talk. It's a student-only event, so it will be no, well, one administrator, and our uh, Shania as well will be there. This is an opportunity for our students to feel safe, have an informal discussion on things that are impacting them currently in society and the environment that they live or experience, whether it's school or through their friendships or their family lives. Um, following that would be Curls and Conversations led by the Women of Black Student Association, and that will be February 20th, and both of these events take place in U111. Then we have our live museum and monologues project. That takes place February 12th, and this is where our Black Student Association students will be playing roles of historical prominent black figures. And just to quickly mention the figures, we have Mary Eliza Mahoney, John Baptiste Dusable, Gwen Eiffel, Aretha Franklin, Muhammad Ali, Dr. Macy Jameson, Shirley Chisholm, Thurgood Marshall, and Alvin Ailey. Then we move on to Juneteenth, a celebration of freedom, an opportunity to give people more awareness and understanding of a forgotten holiday. That takes place February 21st, 1230 to 145 here in the library. Then the last event is African Diaspora Day. This event will feature a African diaspora exhibit in U111 as well as an opportunity to taste Caribbean food and participate in different experiences culturally related on campus. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. Again, I'm Tiana Richards, and I thank you everyone for taking the time out to come to this event.